So if you find yourself living a smooth life, what you're asking is, I want to live a life of a dead person. These ups and downs tells you that you're still alive. When you are down, all you have to do is hunker down and know the next beat is going to be up. And when you are on top of that beat, never become too arrogant because always remember winter is coming and winter shall come. Welcome to the podcast where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We're bringing the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your life and career forward. I have a great one for you today, folks. My guest today is Naveen Jain. Naveen's current ventures include Viome and Moon Express. And as a serial entrepreneur, he previously founded Infospace, Intellis, and TalentWise, which we'll get into. And Viome, Viome, sorry, Naveen's mission is to make illness optional. We hopefully will get to a world uh, like that shortly. And Viome has a built-in AI-driven platform that analyzes the interaction between food and our microbiome and our human cells to develop precision nutrition to prevent and reverse chronic diseases. And MoonPay is the only company global with permission to harvest resources from the moon. We're going to get into that. I want to I hear how we harvest from the moon. And developing the infrastructure needed to push humanity forward toward a true multi-planetary society. This is big, lofty dreams that are accessible and within our reach. So that's exciting. And we'll get into all that in his background. So let's jump right in. He's got a roster of past and present and likely future ventures that have said, have had some pretty incredible impact. So I want to dig into it and get started. Naveen, welcome to the podcast. Well, Adam, it's an honor and a pleasure. And I've heard so much about you and uh, your podcast. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I, I certainly appreciate it. And I, and I love to hit the rewind button. It was funny before we got started. He's like, I've done this 300, 400 times already. Uh, oh. But it, but for me, honestly, it's it's a, I, I like to understand where people's roots are. Mm -hmm. And typically, I mean, I'll start. Let's talk about your upbringing in India. And I believe you were uh, born in the New Delhi area. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit. It was it was about growing up there in the in the in the early 60s. Uh, tell us about your parents, your family and, and the life there, because much different than when you are today. Well, first of all, Adam, um, you know, I just don't like to talk about myself because I think there are so much lessons. I'm 64 years old now, so I'd rather talk about all the lessons of life that I've learned in the 64 years because nobody wants to hear about me and who I am. I think they want to hear about everything they can do, and I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes talking to you about this idea of how do you look at these Eastern philosophy, merge them with the Western philosophy to take the idea of uh, spirituality and idea of capitalism and really bring them together? And Let's how do you view it. the world uh, in a way that most people have just never thought about? That, that's, see, that's heavy. And we're going to get heavy, but first we have to stay light a bit, a little bit. Little yeah. bit. Tell, tell, us, tell us about your parents. What did, what did your sure. parents do for a living? I want to hear about your upbringing. Yeah, so I think, again, uh, you know, we grew up in India. Uh, we were very poor. We didn't have food to eat. We didn't have a place to stay. Uh, you know, but to me, that is what made me who I am. And in some sense, it is that resiliency that it doesn't matter where you come from. And what really matters is where you are going and stay focused on your North Star. And it's amazing thing that you learn in life is that if you believe universe is your friend, it doesn't matter what's happening. You believe it's for your good. And at any point in your life, the minute you start to just love yourself, and I mean is that self-love that we preach and talk about, and most people don't understand what that means. And I'm not talking about being narcissistic. I'm not talking no. about that being a self-egotistic. When I say self-love, it's simply about pursuing your dreams without having to get someone else's approval of what you can and cannot do and should or should not do and would or would not do. And once you get there, the minute you fall in love with yourself is the minute the world will fall in love with you. I love that. 
Do you remember? Do you remember early on in your childhood the first time you fell in love with yourself? Well, it's you know it's always been that, and that you know to some extent. Uh, but was there a people, moment? Was there was there a situation? Yeah, yeah. So I think, and this is, I think this is a misnomer, and people tend to rewrite history. People tend to rewrite their life stories, but it's never the last straw that breaks the camel back. We all know it is the all the straws that came before it that breaks the camel back, right? So the point is, every experience you have, every interaction you have changes who you become. And the last thing that you see is the pivotal moment is never that pivotal moment. It just happened to be the trigger or a catalyst, but it's really everything before that is what changes you. So I'm going to make a little bit of a left turn here. Do you believe in the butterfly effect? Well, it is not only the butterfly effect, it is more about strings of butterfly effect, if you know how what so? I mean. No, but elaborate, how please so, so. Yeah, so obviously, think about the butterfly effect says that a small change that happens, it actually has a long change and a bigger change in the outer years. And what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> it is the strings of small, small changes that actually are constantly happening in your life. That means every single time you talk to someone, it just gives you that small hint of, oh, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. And that constantly when you have these interactions with hundreds of people, one day you start to think differently. And it wasn't the butterfly effects in the first conversation or the second conversation. It was the strings of interaction that you have had. Um, and that really, to me, becomes a key to what you become. And a lot of the times people ask you, you know, if you could change something in your life, uh, what would you change? And, the, you know, going back to that, you know, we talked about self-love. If you are in love with who you are today, then you should not be looking to change anything in your previous life because good or bad is what made you who you are. And if you love it the way you are, why would you want to change anything? That's that's that that's so true. So I want to talk about your early business influences. When when was that? Do you remember that first time you you you, you started to feel a pull towards technology and innovation? I mean, was it was it always in your blood? When when did you feel that? Well, you know, again, the technology has always been around, and it is this people have this weird idea of. The latest thing that we have is the technology. And before that, it's all, uh, you know, something non-tech, right? And it is really weird. I mean, the wheel was technology, right? The invention of the wheel was technology, if you want to look at exactly. it like that, right? <laughs> and the point is, once the technology becomes part of our life, we forget it is a technology, right? So people say, oh, I don't want robots in my house, right? But guess what? Your dishwasher is a robot. It's a, right? Your washing machine is a robot, right? And we no longer think of it as an AI robot in our house. It is just what we do, right? And I really think... As we start to bring, you know, this iPads and you have the kids walking up to TV and they want to swipe the channel, they go to no. TV and they're swiping it left and right and they're wondering what the hell is wrong with this TV? Why it's not swiping to the next channel? It's actually a, a funny, a funny side note. So, so last night I have two little kids. I have an 11 year old and a six year old. And last night we're doing their lunch orders for school. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm using my MacBook that's in front of me and my five year old starts trying yeah. to swipe my MacBook and he's like, dad, why can't I swipe your MacBook? I'm like. <laughs> Why yeah. haven't they done that yet? I'm like, and I had to explain to them, well, because they want you to buy the iPad. There's yeah, a reason yeah. for that, because if you could swipe on my MacBook, you probably wouldn't need the iPad um, at all. But I I, I digress, Naveen. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Bill Gates. Before your time at Microsoft, um, did your vision of him change from what before you interacted, engaged, and worked at Microsoft and, and while you were there and afterwards? I'd love to take a little bit of a deep dive into this and, and get into some of those impressions and learnings and interactions uh, with Bill? Well, you know, first of all, you know, set aside Bill, every person, when you look them from outside, 
you're looking at their public persona as what who they are. And that's one thing, like, you know, we look at these Hollywood movies and there's an actor who happens to be in a romantic movie. And we have this wonderful idea. Oh, my God, this person must be so romantic. And that you have this idea built up and then you meet the person, turns out to be a complete asshole for all you complete know. Complete dud, yes. <laughs> complete dud. And so point is these ideas of the people's persona is really who they are. And, you know, you can, I know, I, again, I hate name dropping, so I'm not going to go there. It's but fine. the point is you can pick any person that you know and, you know, pick a name you want that you read in the newspaper and you suddenly think this person is this, right? Look at Richard Branson. He's a great example. His public persona is this. He's a carefree person just having all these nude models around him and he's out there having fun. And you meet him in a real life. He is probably the most introvert, shy person you ever meet, right? I've, I've heard, I've, I've heard that. <laughs> Yeah, I've, and I watch. I watch. I actually watched the Branson documentary. It's interesting. I watched yeah. a Branson documentary on a, on a recent flight, um, yeah. and you really get to to learn about a little bit more about who he is and how he interacts, and and this extrovert in public, right? But yeah. introverted on the inside, and people go out to Necker Island, and they yeah. have, they have various ex- experiences with them. So let, let's let's talk about let's. Let, well, I want to talk about. We can name drop. Bill Gates is is it a pivotal part of your career uh, career journey? Um, what, what was he? What was he like in a day to day? Not not so much like like standing on a stage yeah. presenting, but but in a day to day workforce as a as a manager, mm-hmm. as a people leader, as a as a visionary. Well, I'll tell you, extremely brilliant guy. And one of the things you would find about Bill is he is able to get to the actual root cause very very quickly. You could present him all the powerpoints in the thing. And he will focus on the thing that we haven't even thought about. What about this? And then you have all these things prepared and then you suddenly figure out, well, you haven't been thinking about it yet. Right? And that's really that intense bill that you you know fall in love with. The man who is just absolutely smart, brilliant, driven, dedicated, and someone who really wants to change the world, never set out, I want to be the richest man, right? Look at Elon. Elon. Elon literally bet every penny he made, whether it is Zip2 or whether it is, you know, uh, Axe or PayPal, dot, PayPal, and he bet everything. I mean, there was a point of time in his life within a week of going bankrupt, right? So here is a man who bet everything. He didn't say, let me bet everything so I can be the richest man. And this is really what I think, uh, Adam, I think the conversation we could shift is, what is really interesting I find in life is making money is a byproduct of doing things that improve people's life. And I want to explain that a bit for a second, Please. right? So if you, as an entrepreneur, if you can build any product or a service that improves the lives of a billion people, you can create a $100 billion company, but you don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to make $100 billion, what should I do? Just remember, making money is a byproduct of doing things that improve people's life. It is never the goal. It is always the outcome. It is an output when the input is something that actually makes the changes. I've had the opportunity to interview <clears throat> extremely successful folks on this show if we're using a gauge of monetary wealth. Yeah. And they all say to me, money is a fuel to their options. Yeah. They envision money as a, as, a, as a fuel to enable them to do what they do. And yourself, you have been worth insane amounts of money, lost tons of money, been up and been down. How, how, do, how do you view money? Well, first of all, you never lose anything. So that's a fundamental. I, I think how so? you have to. So remember, Billy, when you are born, we are born with nothing. So if you have a okay. dollar in your pocket, you've earned a dollar. You're a dollar richer than you have ever been. So people look at these fluctuations of these things as something they owned or lost. What I believe is you are simply a trustee of God's kindness. And God continues to give you his kindness 
and he expect as you as a trustee to use his will and his guidance to do the good in the world and when you move away from doing that good in the world he says let me find a new trustee because you are no longer doing you are no longer following the guidelines i gave you and so when you you move away from that that god finds a new trustee and suddenly you say i lost something no you didn't that it is simply a signal for you to get back to the path and then guess what the god said oh you are an amazing trustee let me give you some more for you to go do the good in the world and as long as you stay focused on doing good in the world you it. constantly get these things you want in life so ask yourself what are you willing to die for and then live for it right wow. so you have to find something that you're willing to dedicate your life to solving and then spend most of your life solving it that's 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 fascinating so let's bring it back to your career journey and and now you're at a point at microsoft when when the next move is coming and i let me let me read this here cuz i want to make sure i get this right um i believe that you said uh towards the end of your time at microsoft that there wasn't an opportunity for any single person to innovate from within. Was well, that your motivation to to move on and for yourself to innovate and and build something on your own? So, well, it's really interesting is it comes a time in every company's life and this is what I call the life cycle of successful companies is it they small startup that is just dedicated to solving a problem that they see their life calling. they stay focused and they disrupt the whole industry and they become the market leader and at that point they start to focus on simply incremental thing they stop taking those risks and another startup comes along and they focus on that particular problem that been missing around and they take over right i mean if you look at the company's burrows is spare most of you are like the people roll their eyes who what was this company digital equipment corporation i mean remember that came along with a mini frame that took on a main frame and people are still probably rolling their eyes what are you talking about but they used to be these massive computers they took over the whole building and they needed to be a, you know cool environment and we ran these massive mainframe computer and we had these terminals that you worked on that connected to the things like then we had these mini frames you could actually have a computer in your department right and they took over and then the pcs came about and they disrupted the whole thing yep. right <laughs> and became a distributed processing but guess what now the cycle has come back again if you look at the cloud computing it is back to the mainframe basically right and yeah, we have these tiny warehouses <laughs> warehouses right and we have these computers which are basically terminal that are connected to the cloud now and we are back to the same old way of doing i things. never even thought of it i never even thought about it like that right like we it's kind of come back to that right you yeah, look at these yeah. corporations with these giant yeah. computers in the room yeah. and then in the same breath like we have more computing power in this phone yeah. than a whole building for the yeah. old original IBM mainframes right it, it yeah. it's 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 fascinating and it, and it's cyclical it's cyclical there too so was that an easy decision for you to leave microsoft what well, never a easy decision so to say that remember when you are living a life of a comfort life where you think you can start to now cruise along then you obviously it's never easy but here is what i learned adam in my life is that if you want to be alive the only way you know you are alive is you check your pulse and say do you have a heartbeat and people forget what the heartbeat looks like heartbeat is goes up and down and up and down and when it is smooth you're dead Right. So if you find yourself living a smooth life what you're asking is I want to live a life of a dead person right these ups and downs tells you that you're still alive when you are down all you have to do is hunker down and know the next beat is going to be up and when you are on top of that beat never become too arrogant because always remember winter is coming and winter shall come Let's pause on that for a second because that that one's hitting home for me right now by trade i'm a recruiter and my business yep. is dependent on the economy when people yep. aren't hiring my business yep. isn't thriving so you have to be able to ride that roller coaster you have to be able to go the up and down and if you stay like this in life if you stay yep. like stagnant yep that's You're not dead. living that's not yeah. that's 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 not living this is a fascinating analogy and this is one that hits home and i appreciate you for sharing that i want to shift back um let's talk about yep. the the netscape ipo that uh, finally mm-hmm. got you to leave and start uh, infospace What what was going through your head at that time? 
Well, first of all, there was no network IPO when I left. I, it was, mm. you know, I left very early in 1989, uh, in 96 to start a company. And the fundamental belief at that point was really crazy idea that one day, now just think about it. I am in 2000 now. I started a company that was going to build the services for mobile phone. And there were no mobile phone out there that were smartphones at that time, right? People, right. the fanciest phone was a flip phone we called Motorola StarTrek. That was we, the fanciest phone. Could we, could we pause on the StarTrek for a moment? Because I still have yeah. mine. I found it in, in an old box. That yeah. might have been and still be the greatest phone ever created, the Motorola StarTrek. Let's just, let's just let's just pour one out for <clears throat> Motorola StarTech. What a great piece of, of technology. And by the way, continue. most people have not seen it. It was simple phone, and all it had was it was five it's numbers. And all you could do is, yeah. That, and by the way, all you could do was make a phone call. And that's it, right? Now, it's really interesting was, we said, what if? So year 2000, I remember interviewing at, with, at Washington Post. Uh, I still remember the name of the reporter, Leslie Walker. And if you can Google Leslie Walker in my name and you will he see this interview. And I'm telling her in 2000, seven years before the iPhones came out, I said, Leslie, one day we're going to have a phone. You'll be able to get your email. You'll be able to get your contact. You'll be able to get your stock quote and weather. And, you know, and guess what? You will, they will know where you are. When you drive by the Starbucks, you'll get a coupon for Starbucks. And you will be using your phone to make a payment, not using your credit card. And she looks at me and says, I don't know, sir, what world you live in, not in my lifetime. <laughs> and I called her seven but, years later when the iPhone came out. I said, Leslie, I hope you're alive because it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> that was now, I told you so moment. Yeah. No, it wasn't that I told you so moment. To me, actually, it was such clear idea of it was going to happen. Most people thought I have this StarTech phone with a tiny screen. Why would anybody want to get their email on that? In those days, we used to have Palm Pilots. And I think mm -hmm. people are now like rolling their eyes, Palm Pilots. And they used to have pager, literally a pager attached yeah, to their beepers. belt. Mm -hmm. The beepers, right? And they had these Palm Pilots. And I was thinking, oh my God, why can't we put a phone on a Palm Pilot, right? Rather than put a Palm Pilot on a phone. And that's literally the iPhone was putting a phone inside the Palm Pilot, literally. And it was, well, it was also technological evolution. I mean, we think about the BlackBerry, right? The BlackBerry yeah, yeah. was another one of those. Um, yep. I mean, if people could go back to the history of the BlackBerry, that I think yep. it's one of the, the it, it reached the pinnacle. And then why do you think the BlackBerry failed? Was For it the many, iPhone many, marketing? Did, did, the, no, did no. the iPhone, what was it? Because the technology, so, I mean, it was a fantastic product. Yeah, so the thing was, they went after a corporate market and they had complete, I mean, there is not a the single person who didn't use BlackBerry, BBM. I mean, oh. most people don't know what BBM was. BlackBerry BBM. Messenger, of course we did. You had your code, you had your ID. I love Black and typing on an actual keyboard before <laughs> it went, right. you know, havoc. But that is the brilliance. When iPhone came out, everyone said Steve Jobs lost it. How can you have a phone without a keypad? I mean, how the hell are you going to ever use a phone without a keypad? You need to dial the phone number. And his answer was 99% of the time you talk to people who are on your contact. You simply press the button. You don't have That's to it. type in the phone number. And people did not believe that, right? In fact, there was a time when... If BBM went, uh, IBM, I'm uh, sorry, Apple went to uh, BlackBerry Messenger and said, would you license us the BBM so we can put it on our iPhone and everyone can use that? And they thought they could drive Apple iPhone out of business and they weren't going to give the BBM away, right? Wow. And that is a history. I mean, you can, by the way, look back, even the going back to our days in the PC, um, IBM, they, before the MS-DOS, and most people probably don't know what MS-DOS is. MS-DOS is what Microsoft got started with. This was a Microsoft uh, DOS the, you know, disk operating system, right? Uh, and it That's used what I to learned on in, in, yeah. in elementary school. I learned DOS prompts. I made the rocket ship fly. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I worked on MS-DOS 1.2 in my younger life. But anyway, the point was, they didn't even have that. They bought it from a guy who was <laughs> Tim. He bought it from Tim uh, and essentially put the MS-DOS and sold it. But IBM, at that time, there used to be an operating system that's called CPM. The CPM 
was an operating system everybody wanted. IBM flew in to talk to the CEO of uh, the company, DAC. They wanted the CPM. And they guy decided to go golfing rather than meet IBM. And they finally got frustrated and went to Microsoft and uh, built essentially licensed them MS-DOS. But point I'm trying to make is that all these things happen because when people have opportunity, they became so arrogant they, because they were on top of that world and they didn't realize that winter is coming. And then for every one of these companies, the winter did come. People forget about Alta Vista. Alta Vista was a search engine to beat. I mean, yep. it was a search engine to beat. I remember. And then came Inktomi. Inktomi became the search engine to beat, right? And now people don't remember <laughs> that. And Google came along and in fact, at that time, Yahoo oh, Yahoo had bought Inktomi, and they have integrated Inktomi, and they basically Google gave Yahoo five percent of the company and say, oh, "Can you make us the search engine?" Right, and the rest is all history. Right, and the rest is history. Gentlemen across the nation, I have an urgent message for you. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, the brand that took your balls to space is now launching them to the ultrasphere. Introducing the Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra, featuring a new cutting edge design and next generation dual skin safe blade heads for different shaves. It's pretty much a spaceship to take your boys downstairs to the next level. Join the 9 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with the brand new Lawn Mower 5.0 Ultra by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code POZCAST, P O Z C A S T. High tech for low places. That's Manscaped. And I got to tell you, since I got my hands on this pair of trimmers, my life downstairs has changed. My wife loves it, if you know what I mean. But let me tell you, this has made it so much easier to take care of what I need to do downstairs. You know what? Take it on the go. Manscaped has you covered. This puppy comes with a travel case and even a travel lock to avoid any accidental powering on or weird looks in the airport. Guys, check this out. Go to manscaped.com, get 20% off when you use the code POSCAST, plus free shipping. I'm telling you, your balls have been through enough. It's time to go ultra with Manscaped. Check it out. How do you manage as a leader, you know, ego versus success versus having a clear vision on the future? So I think there's several, I think, let's just unpack There's a lot here. there. Yeah, there's a yeah lot so there. let's just unpack here for one thing at a time here. So let's just start as an entrepreneur. What? How do you start something that is audacious, that is a moonshot idea? Mm -hmm. And I want to give a framework that I use for myself as a framework that every time I start any company, any project, anything worthwhile, I ask myself three questions. Why this? Why now? Why me? And I want just to expand on each one. First one, I think I've kind of touched on earlier. The first question you ask yourself is, whatever it is that you're trying to do, ask yourself, God forbid, I am actually successful in solving this problem. Would it help a billion people live a better life? And the reason is, again, it's not just a philanthropic thing to do. As I mentioned earlier, if you can improve the lives of a billion people, you can create a massive enterprise, right? And if you know you want to create a massive enterprise, you have to stay focused on solving a massive problem, right? You wake up in the morning and ask yourself, what can I do today that will improve someone else's life? And if you stay focused on that, next thing you know, you have this massive enterprise that you have created because those customers whose life is getting better because of you, they become your loyal customer. The second part is why now? And this is the thing that you learn as an entrepreneur is the number one predictor of your success is neither your previous successes, nor your team, nor anything else other than timing. The timing is the number one predictor of success, right? So look at Facebook. Facebook, most people may or may not know, was not the first social network. Before that, MySpace. used to be a company called MySpace. And before MySpace, Adam was? A Come on. AOL Messenger. AOL Messenger? No, 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 dude. dude Friendster. Oh, Friendster. I, right, I, I, you know, people forget about Friendster. Yeah. People, people always go to MySpace, but there was Friendster before. Tom from MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
So Friendster, right? So point oh, yes. was Friendster. So, so right, and before there used to be personal home pages, right? So literally how the world evolved until we hit that right timing and the Facebook just took off, right? And that's really in life is what is the timing? So how do you know when the timing is right? And let me now give you how to look into the crystal ball. Please, wait, hold on. I got, I got, I got, I, wait, I got, wait, where's my, I have a sound effect. Here, wait, sorry. Here, here, here's my crystal ball sound effect. Naveen, right. let's go deep into the crystal ball. Yes. There you go. All right. So there is a crystal ball. Ask <laughs> yourself a simple question. What had changed in the last one to two years? But more importantly, what do you expect to change in the next three to five years that will allow mm. you to solve this problem at scale in three to five years? And this problem could not have been solved five years ago. So you're suddenly looking at where the technology is headed, can you intercept the technology when it is about to hit the knee of the curve? And how do you know that? There are several things that I've learned how to do that. One is you start to see what are these technologies that are constantly on exponential curve uh, and they're doubling every year. And then you can say, oh my God, look in three years where they will be. And you can see the cost, like in our case at Viome, seven years ago when we started, we saw, look, there are three things that have to happen for us to solve this massive problem. Let me stop for a second. I'm going to talk about Viome for a second. I'm going to come back to it. In a, uh, Please. But, yeah, we're going to get to it eventually, yeah, but now's a good point. Yeah, yeah, let, yeah. So let me just continue staying on this path, right? So you start to see what technologies are changing. Remember the Kodak. Kodak invented a digital camera. Kodak went out of business by a digital camera. How did that happen? Because the Kodak inventor showed them a digital camera that was 0.1 megapixel. And everyone laughed at him and he said, but sir, in six months it's gonna be 0.2, six months later it's gonna be 0.4. And they laughed at him and said, do you see these beautiful chemical pictures? Are you crazy? Shut that project down. Like, little they realize, Guess what? A decade later, it was a one megapixel, two megapixel mm -hmm. camera, and the whole Kodak got the Kodak got Kodak. And that verb being Kodak is now actually gets used by someone to say, Are you going to actually disrupt yourself or are you going to get Kodak? They right? they put themselves out of business. That's right. They did. Right. Now, question is how do you as an entrepreneur take someone else and codec them, right? And what's really happening is the disruptors are getting disrupted faster than ever. So it used to be when you are an entrepreneur, you say, oh my God, someone else has already done this. They're already four or five years ahead of me. And if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm saying, oh, so they're two years getting from getting Kodak, now the timing is right for me to take the next technology and completely disrupt them, right? So you, you build a whole business and someone says, oh, I can use generative AI. I don't need any of the shit anymore, right? And the whole business that someone spent five years building is gone, kaput, right? And that's literally is happening faster and faster. So imagine how Uber disrupted the taxi mm -hmm. industry, the town car industry. Right. Now, as we get the autonomous cars, what is Uber did? They created a marketplace of a driver and passenger. Now, if you get the autonomous car, who is the driver? The car manufacturer. So Tesla can instantly become the Uber and completely disrupt Uber because they're going to have more drivers than Uber would ever have. And they have right. access to all the passengers, right? And, and, and suddenly they have the, the audience, cost, correct. They have the audience, they have the cheaper price because you don't need a person to drive it anymore. And next thing you know, Uber is going to get Ubered, right? <clears throat> and that are you, is- are you, call, are you calling that right now? Are you predicting, are we predicting, right? Are we, are we predicting yeah. that this is going to happen? That yes. Tesla is going to overtake Uber once yes. autonomous cars become- 100%. Everyone feels comfortable. Yes. And I really Ooh. think that is how it is going to happen, that Uber is going to get Uber by Tesla here, right? I think if you look at every industry, um, that is going to, in the next 15 years, half of the Fortune 500 companies won't be around because they're going to have some entrepreneur take them on. And that means the king is going to be, uh, king is going to be dead. And that means you have a chance to become the new king. 
And every entrepreneur should look at what technologies are at their disposal to go out and disrupt any industry they want. And how do you do that? There comes the third part, why me? And that comes down to is what questions are you asking that are different from what everyone else in the industry is asking? And it doesn't matter what uh, what industry you attack. So let's assume you say, Adam, I want to solve world hunger problem. Let's take a big fucking problem, Big right? swing, big swing. Big yeah. swing, world hunger. <clears throat> and any experts you ask about world hunger, what are they going to say? Well, we need to find a way to stop the spoilage of food. We need to learn to distribute the food. We need to get, cut down the waste of the food and blah, 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 right? And no one will ever say why do we eat food? And just simply the question you ask, why we eat food, changes the whole perspective because we need food for energy and we need food, food for nutrition. How many different ways can you get energy? Well, plants get energy from photosynthesis. Right, there sorry. are bacteria that grow actually in radioactive nuclear waste. That means they have figured out how to protect their DNA from radiation and use radiation as a source of energy. As energy. Can mm-hmm. we take the, bacteri- the genes from these bacteria, use CRISPR to in vivo modify ourselves? And next thing you know, we are radiation resistant and say, honey, do you want to go out for radiation? Not rather than go out for a walk pizza. on Mars. Go out for a walk, walk on, on Mars. Mars right? So point is, suddenly by asking a different question, it changes the perspective of how you solve the that. problem, right? I love that now, mindset. Let me give you two more examples, which I Please. think I want to just show you different areas. Climate change. Everyone is worrying about climate change. But guess what? They say to solve the climate change, we got to get rid of the fossil fuel. We got to get make all the cars electric cars. And by the way, I'm not remotely suggesting that humans did not create the problem, but let's just be, let's just get the facts right. There is humans, all the carbon that we emit in the atmosphere, 90% of it comes from forest fires, decomposition of leaves, and erupting of volcanoes. The 10% that humans did changed the whole, basically what I call the ecosystem, it there was an ecosystem was in balance. Eco- got equilibrium, the, right. Equilibrium is now gone. Now, we can be blind and say, we took this 10%, we got to cut down the 10%. Or we can say, we are homo erectus. We are the homo sapiens. We don't need to worry about 10%. Let's focus the damn thing on 90%. Because even if I can take a 10% of the 90%, I have removed everything that humans created. Right. right? Now, imagine how it is we can do. Now, people say, how? Well, what if you well, can stop the volcanoes from erupting? What okay. are you talking about? Well, why do volcanoes erupt? Well, there's a tremendous amount of pressure that gets built. What if you can release the pressure like a pressure cooker and stop that? Now, imagine there are going to be 100,000 or million satellites in the low Earth orbit. Every right. inch of every uh, part of Earth is going it's to be mapped. monitored. Matt, now that means we can detect the earliest fire and actually stop it. And if we did that, that's going to take care of all the things. And it's a much bigger people, swing. It's much, much bigger, bigger swing, swing to attack the 90% than the 10%. That, that's right. And even on 10%, most people forget that majority of the fossil fuel is not used in the cars. It's used in making steel, Production. Production. steel, cement. Plastic, fertilizer. The factories, <laughs> right? And let, let's just talk. I mean, I, I want your hot take on this, right? But when people talk about electronic cars, and I'm all for. Yeah. But people don't realize the amount of fossil fuels burned yeah. to mine the the element in the battery, which is more harmful than fossil fuels burning. I mean, is that a true statement? Well, it's, it is. It is. It does take a lot of. It does a lot of harm to the ecosystem. And in many places, electricity itself that you're charging your car comes from coal. Some They're burning coal to make the, to power the Tesla power truck. Where do you think the electricity is coming from? I say this all the time. I go, where do you think the electric? You think everything's a, a hydroelectric dam? Yeah. No. Uh, anyway, the point I'm going to make anyway. is that yes, we need to do that. We need to do this and that, not this or that, right? And given a choice, do both. Take a swing at ninety percent, and yes. We need to get down to the renewable energy, take solar. We need to take solar. We need to have wind power. We need to have all of that. Right. Yeah. Renewable and, energy. And by the way, we also need to be able to do uh, nuclear, especially fusion. And I predict right here, Adam, for you, within a decade, 
we're going to have a fusion energy that is going to be so portable that you can have a fusion power reactor in your factory, in your home, in your neighborhood. I've, I've, I've seen this and I've been following one of my, my friend, a big shout out to Gary yeah. over there. We've been talking, my friend Gary's been talking about yeah. how, again, like we talk about uh, the, the exponential factor of technology yeah. growth, the same thing with nuclear power, safer, yeah. cleaner, smaller, more compact to yeah. be able to harness that technology. It's in our lifetime. It's in it my is. lifetime. It's in my kid's lifetime, my grandkid's lifetime. This is going to happen in a, because we're, we're so early. I mean, if you think about the, 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 the time spectrum of development and technology, where nuclear power is going, we're still relatively early on. Well, so, so now think about it. Once you get free energy, everything changes, right? So think about today, we fight over three things, land, water, and energy. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't fight over air. Why is that? Because we believe air is in abundance. We can sit 60,000 of us in a stadium. And when someone takes a deep breath, we don't slap the guy and say, right. you just took a deep breath. That was my air. Save me. What? Right? Same. Everybody say, hey, take it. another deep breath. We got plenty of it. Right? Now, imagine when we have free energy. Guess what? You can have now fresh, clean water because you can desalinize. You can mm-hmm. distill the water, right? You have all of that. You can have free food and suddenly the world changes, right? So I really think when, when we start to have democratization and demonetization of energy, everything in our world will everything. change. When we talk about land, what if we could live on any galaxy, any universe? Where is really the scarcity of land. Right? You're removing from the equation. So I, I want to be mindful of our time here and I want to talk about Biome. Let's talk yeah. about the mission and yeah. where we're at in the development process. So think about, I started Biome with a one simple belief, Adam. Seven years ago, we say, what if we can understand the changes that happen in the human body that makes us develop these chronic diseases? Mm-hmm. What are these chronic diseases? Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer, Parkinson, cancer, right? Aging, these are all chronic diseases. An interesting thing about chronic diseases is you don't wake up in the morning and say, honey, I was out with the boys last night. I think I might have caught diabetes. No, you don't catch diabetes. You develop over 10, 15, 20 years over time, right? Now, what if we can understand what is changing? And my belief was, Adam, that we as human species haven't really changed, right? And yet younger and younger people are getting sicker and sicker. What is going Diet. on? Diet, right? So it's our garbage. thinking was, first of all, how do we know what is changing? And this is coming back to asking the right question. Interesting thing was we said, look, everyone in the industry is focused on understanding your genes, your DNA. Every company said, oh, I need to know about your DNA. We can predict what's going on. And it occurred to me that our DNA never changes. So no. let's assume you do my DNA test today. Right. And God forbid I gain 200 pounds. You do my DNA test again, the same DNA. Now Not I have changing. diabetes. Not change. I become diabetic. No DNA change. I become heart disease. No DNA change. I have now depression, anxiety, and then I die. 100 years after I die, you do my DNA test again. Same DNA. DNA can't even tell you you're dead or alive, let alone you're healthier or sicker. And that it's was a, my first it's a map. thing. Was, it's, a, it's a map. That's all it is. It's, a de- it's an alphabet. Yeah. It's an alphabet. alphabet. Mm-hmm. And the RNA is how you story you write. Just to explain in a layman Please. terms, every part of our body is identical DNA. My hair, my skin, my eyes, my heart, my kidney, my lung, my nails, my finger, identical DNA then why is it I don't have the eyes developing, eyes growing on my finger and the nails growing on my head? Same DNA. Well, the answer is when the DNA is changes into RNA, some genes are overexpressed, some genes mm-hmm. are underexpressed. So same DNA can make anything it wants. So DNA is the, like an alphabet. RNA is the story you are writing. So what story are you writing, right? So first question was, can we do at Wyoming, can we do RNA testing? And everyone told me, you're crazy because no company has ever done RNA testing. As an entrepreneur, you say, forget about how, is, would this solve the problem? And the answer was kind of. Well, what do you mean kind of? What's the second problem? Well, second problem is 99% of all the genes that are expressed in our body don't come from our mom and dad. 
Where do they come from? Huh? They call microbiome. These organisms, hundred trillion of them, they live in our gut, in our mouth, all mm-hmm. over our body. They literally control every part of our body, right? So what happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. It changes your brain. They can they can actually make you depressed. They can make you hungry. They can make you thirsty. They can make you stop eating food. They literally control everything in your body. Now, the, the clear evidence, in fact, just Google Parkinson's and microbiome, Alzheimer's and microbiome, cancer and microbiome, diabetes and microbiome, obesity and microbiome. Every disease is now connected to microbiome. The question was, if everyone believes that, why is this problem not getting solved? And again, the problem was everyone in the industry was asking the same wrong question. They wanted to know what organisms are in Adam's gut, what organisms are in Naveen's gut. Well, it turns out the same way. It's not the organism, but what they are producing that matters, right? So in a sense, the same organism can produce something good in one person, one environment, and the same organism in a different environment can produce something toxic, right? So a lot of people don't realize they take all these probiotics like acarmensia. They Mm -hmm. buy acarmensia without realizing it can be good for you and produce butyrate or it can cause you MS, same organism. Right. So you could be actually causing yourself sick by taking these things willy nilly. Avocado can be good for you or it can be harmful to you if you have high uric That's, acid production. I mean, a simple analogy is two people at the same a same exact meal. One person gets sick, one doesn't. Right. Like Because it's but affecting identical, you differently. Identical twins can have completely different impact. So this is what we do, uh, uh, Adam. At home, you can order a test. It's a f- at-home test. Go to Vium.com and you give us a spit of your saliva, mm-hmm. finger, four drops of your finger prick blood, and a touch of your stool. What you get back after two weeks in your app is your biological age. How old are you? Right? So, for example, I'm 64. How- My bi- biological age is now down to 52. Now, imagine Congratulations. when I'm 70, my biological age could be down to 40. And my wife thinks she married a young man. And that's really funny. <laughs> well, you have great hair still. I mean, let's let's talk about how old your hair is. I mean, that's some great the, hair right there. The, thank I, you. We, it's <laughs> uh, no, but interestingly, it gives you your cognitive health, your cardiac health, and your gut important. health, your oral health. And by the way, not only that, it can go as deep as you want. You want to get nerdy. Here's your butyrate production. Here's your putrescent production. Here's your sulfide production, uric acid production. But more importantly, what we say is, hey, Adam, don't eat broccoli right now that's, because that's your sulfide say. production is too high. Don't eat spinach right now because your oxalates are not being metabolized, right? Don't eat turmeric right now, even though everyone thinks it's healthy because your bile acid production is too high. Right. So we literally tell you what food you should eat and why, what food you should not eat and why. And it's not forever. It's only now. And when you do a retest well, in six months, your body changes. Well, that, that was one of my questions, too. Does it identify which are permanent? Like, for example, my body doesn't react well to avocado. This is a lifetime <laughs> based on mm. that. How, how, how does it know? I it's, mean, how, it's how, not a lifetime. So basically, it is simply about uric acid production. Mm. When your microbiome changes, Guess what happened? Your uric acid, uric acid production comes down. And then you say, now you can eat avocado because it's totally fine. You, otherwise, you're going to develop gout, right? Okay. Now, in addition to that, Adam, we also tell you that these foods are good or bad. But in addition, you need every day, you should take 22 milligram of elderberry, take 29 milligram of amylase, take 27 milligram of berberin. And we literally tell you every vitamin, mineral, herbs, digestive enzyme, peptides, amino acids, probiotic, prebiotic, postbiotic, whatever you need. And then we custom make a capsule with only that ingredient in that dosage. And this is really interesting. Like here are my things. So we make them every month for you. So look at these mine and look right. at the date. We don't say expires on. We say manufactured on. It's made for me 10 days ago. Right. Every so month fresh. I get new ones for me. These are my probiotics and prebiotics. Every do month you, I get them. Do you, these have to are my, do you have to yeah. retest? How often do you have to retest? I test every four months, but you can test every okay. six months. And by the way, these are my auto lozenges to adjust my oral microbiome. 
but let me ask you this: when you take the when you take the actual test, though, is there is there is there a process? Is there like do you have to be like at a baseline? Like, what if I had a meal the day before that ruined my whole biome? What if I it, what if I drank alcohol it, or something? That I makes, had, so it makes does, no difference. Well, so your biome, it's testing your core biome, not affected by the food that's already yeah, in your that's gut. Right. That's okay, right. Wow. Well, now, now, now we're getting a little deep. Actually, we published a study that shows we took people, just told them to keep doing what they do every day for 30 days. And we showed that actually nothing changes unless you drastically cut down some foods and you became, you were a completely meat eater and you become vegan, right? In this is 30 days, it will change, right? But otherwise, it literally goes through and analyzes what's happening in your body. And here is a very interesting thing, uh, Adam, that we learned. We now have analyzed over 600,000 uh, samples. And what we learned is people, we actually published this paper. I think you're going to enjoy it. We showed people in six months when they take our supplements, their diabetes, HbA1c came down by 30%. Mm. Their depression came down by 40% PHQ9. Their anxiety came down by 37%. Their symptoms for IBS, which is stomach ache, constipation, diarrhea, right. by over 40%. In six months, this is food, boys. This is food as a medicine. I, I think I think I might have to give it a try. So let me let me ask you this because I, I want to yeah. be mindful of our, our clock yeah. here. What have the critics been saying against this technology? What what is the pushback? Pushback always is it's new. We don't know enough, right? I am not. I'm giving you the effing food. I'm not mm -hmm. killing you, right? The app, let's assume we got something wrong. So I told you not to eat kale. It's not going to kill you. <laughs> not eating kale is not going to kill you, correct. Right. Point is, but guess what? We have now published more papers than anyone can ask for, including control study. We are now doing a placebo control study using precision supplement to show your metabolic health, your immune health, your digestive health actually gets better. These are like drug trials, right? And this, this is, is talking about, brother, just food and supplements. Yeah. This is this is this is fantastic. And I, I could literally talk to you for, for another hour here, but I do wanna I do wanna kind of bring it back to the core yeah. of the show here and, and yeah. I'm gonna completely take a pivot here. Go for it. You are a seasoned leader. You have been in, you have been around for a long time. You've been around the block. And I want to talk about an age old question. Yeah. When you're interviewing, when you're making a critical hire, yeah. how do you, listen, by the time somebody gets to you, they have the skills, they have the yep. experience. How do you yeah. determine character and values during an interview process? So I actually, by the time they get to me, that means that technically the person is qualified to do whatever right. job they do. They've gotten I to that never, point. Yeah. So here is what I do. I never ask them any question except I ask them, tell me about yourself. Tell me about who you are as a person. I don't want to know about your professional side. What they focus on talking about is who they are. And it's amazing. You will see the people, what they talk about. It tells them exactly what they care about in their lives. Right? You ask me any point of time in my thing and you know, ask me, what am I most proud of? And I will tell you, I'll talk about my children. Right. And that's who I am. It is literally, I'll spend more time talking about my son running built, which is now in the next, you know, I don't know if you know, built is in one of the, one of the multi unicorn line. My daughter is running a woman's health company called Abby. Right. My son is now part of Valor. Right. They both went to Stanford and Wharton. So my daughter and my youngest went to Stanford. My oldest went to Wharton. I can see you lighting up. But guess my point. So that is when you tell people, tell me about who you are, what makes you who you are, what makes you dry, what makes, makes you wake up in the morning. But, you know who they are. But how do you, but, okay, so let's, let's, let's kind of take ourselves out of it for yeah. a moment. What if, what if yeah. you were not a family man? What if you yeah, were sure. a single guy? Never. How would you yeah. remove bias and, and judgment Absolutely. in somebody answering that? Very simple. They tell you about what drives them. They tell you about why they wake up in the morning. They tell you about what makes them jump out of the bed. And you know they are what they care about and is it the same values is the same culture that you care about right so you're not looking for any right answer or wrong answer you're simply looking for what is it who they are and they tell you in their own words by you by not prompting them you simply letting them talk Just open the door open the door on well, that one so before before i bring it home here yeah. i want to i want to i want to end on this quote before before i bring bring it home um i heard you say passion is for losers oh. 
Well, let's unpack that for a moment. Uh, yeah. So basically what I say is a lot of the times we are all told have passion for what we do. And what I realize is passion is for hobbies. I collect space rocks. That's my passion. The true entrepreneurs and winners have obsession. And again, not obsession to make money, not obsession for a thing, obsession not innovate. obsession for a person, obsession to solve a problem. Once you obsess about solving a problem, you go to sleep thinking about it. You wake up in the morning thinking about it. And that is how you actually dedicate your life to solving a problem. Now, just to make it more personal, I lost my dad. And honestly, that was one of the worst things that happened. Watch my dad die from cancer. And I saw and I told my dad, look, I can't save you, but I promise you I'm going to dedicate my life to solving this problem. And that obsession to solve the problem is today we launched a product that are able to detect stage one and pre-stage one cancer in your mouth and throat with 95% specificity. Because my dad died because by the time we got the cancer, he was stage four. And I thought that problem has to be solved and I'm going to solve it. And cheers, cheers to you on that one. So let's bring it home here. Naveen, what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on daily? Something yeah. you wake up, a mantra. Yeah, I tell you that uh, it is primarily around never stop learning. The day you stop learning is the day you die. And in fact, I can tell you that I read every day for at least two, three hours. I read at least three books a month. Uh, wow. And I just, or maybe actually I was going to say three, four, maybe three to four books a month, every week, month. That gives you a lot of knowledge. Remain intellectually curious because if you're not learning, you're dying. Mm -hmm. I love it. And last but not least, you look back on yeah. your life and you think about those moments that were hard, that were tough, that you had to pull yeah. yourself up and mm -hmm. harness that inner tenacity and pull you forward. In the same mm -hmm. breath, you sit here with gratitude yeah. for this family, this life, and making a difference in the world. Naveen Jain, what is your compass? What is your focus? What is your North Star in life? My North Star is that as long as I live and I have a last breath left in me, I'm going to focus on dedicating my life to making the human life better for everyone else. Because having grown up in a poor family, I have it is my duty to give back to the society that I received. And I'm not going to let go of that. And I applaud you for that. And I want to thank you for all that you're doing. I'm going to check out Viam because I want to know what is happening uh, inside here. I mean, I want to thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and your generosity, and really your 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 goal to make this earth a better place. And you're certainly doing it. Everyone, you could follow Naveen uh, on Instagram at Naveen Jane uh, CEO, NaveenJane.com. Check out Viam.com. We'll link them all up in the comments. Any final words? Any final thoughts before we sign off here? Uh, yes, and I want to give, give my uh, gratitude to you and thanks off, thanks to you, my heart's off to you for all you do, Adam, Thank you. because without you, all this wisdom will get lost. So I applaud you for dedicating your life to bringing the wisdom to the people. So please, everyone who's listening to it, let, let Adam know how much you appreciate what he does. And I appreciate that. And everyone listening at home, if this episode meant something to you, leave a review rating. It goes a long way. You know where to find out more at the podcast.com. Follow us on all of our social media channels. Remember, take care of each other. Look out for one another. Be good to yourself. Be better to others. And catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Hey, everybody. I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20-plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepodcast.com.